a way of representing the self. And artists have been making self-portraits for centuries, as you know. But the fact that the image is life-size, following the dimensions of the body, is the exceptional aspect. In my early career as a dance therapist, I explored this way of working with children of various ages, abilities, and challenges as a way of enabling them to see themselves in life-size image onto which they created their own version of who they were. And as a college professor in dance, I involve my dance students in the same process, inviting in their body stories, and I will just say, in dance there's many deep body stories, and their personal dance presentations to accompany the body maps. <laughs> but as Jung reminds us all in Memory, Dreams, Reflections, I do my own work too, in that before I make these assignments, I do my own body maps. I didn't bring it because birds are much more beautiful. <laughs> so, why include body mapping in the Healing Power of Creativity course? Well, body mapping engages the soma, which is the body as experienced from an inward perspective, rather than what we see in the mirror. Soma reflects self as subject rather than self as object. And body mapping addresses our personal body image, and it enables us to consider body as shadow. And that John Conger describes in his 2005 book, Jung and Reich, The Body as Shadow. Working directly with the soma enables participants to access somatic unconscious, which is the realm of all that has been repressed, assaulted and injured at a bodily level. This could involve pre-verbal traumas, such as surgeries, neglect, abuse, abandonment, which were never integrated. The somatic unconscious holds those experiences of violation that could never be verbalized, processed, and they remain held, often rigidly, in that area of the body. Our somas, though, also hold the positive shadow, all the pleasures and delightful sensations we've ever known, but were forgotten, denied, and repressed. In Nietzsche's Zarathustra, Jung introduced and spoke about the notion of this embodied unconsciousness by writing, somewhere our unconscious becomes material because the body is the living unit and our consciousness and our unconscious are embedded in it. They contact the body. In a 2005 article in Spring Journal honoring Marion Whitman, Robin Van Loben Sells asserts, nothing in a body's life goes unregistered. So wholeness enters through the body's door. The threshold of consciousness is a bodily threshold, even for dreams. Without body, we cannot bring our psychophysiological experience to an emotional level of felt psychic experience, which can bridge inevitable gaps in being. Anita Green, in that same 2005 Spring Journal, states, embodied processing involves awareness of what the somatic unconscious is saying with its tensions, blocks, and interruptions in the flow of energy. Body mapping can encompass all of these possibilities. So, what is body mapping? A 2012 article explains, body mapping is a way of telling stories, much like totems contain symbols with different meanings but whose significance can only be understood in relation to the creator's overall story and experience. And in the most recent article on body mapping published in Qualitative Research, body mapping creates a platform and a tool for highlighting and challenging everyday practices. It can 
also transcend linguistic and educational barriers to enable access to a diverse audience and create bridges between divided communities. For this body mapping assignment, for the Pacifica Graduate Institute's course in the Deaf Psychology and Creativity Program with an emphasis in the arts and humanities, which was entitled The Healing Power of Creativity. I asked the students to select a body shape that appealed to them, and then to invite a family member or friend to trace the outline of that shape. And then I invited them to add to the project any colors, collage, photographs that help tell their story. And then the next level was to actually come up with some performative activity to help introduce their self-portrait in a performance media when we were together in person. Daria Halprin also involves her students and clients in creating life-size self-portraits, as well as exploring poetic writing and dancing their self-perceptions. She explains, the intention of movement-based expressive arts therapy is to assist people in developing awareness, creativity, and embodied expression, to facilitate in-depth exploration of personal myth, pathos, and potential, and to catalyze breakthroughs into new ways of being. She also asserts the act of drawing and dancing as process engages the senses, emotions, thoughts, and imagination, taking us into direct experience of ourselves and a productive confrontation with whatever is invoked. In the open space of art-based research, Sean McNiff states, I encourage the pursuit of research that enlivens and deepens our professional and personal commitments, and which corresponds to the dynamics of artistic transformation, healing, and renewal. And Sean McNiff is an expressive arts therapist who himself mostly does visual. In Jungian arts-based research and the nuclear enchantment of New Mexico, our own Susan Rowland presents approaches for Jungian arts-based research that you will witness in my co-presenter's work. In her opening chapter, Susan Rowland explains that the psychology of C.G. Jung and the scholarly practice of arts-based research have the potential to develop each other. She also offers transdisciplinarity as a new framework for knowledge, and so too is arts-based research. I invite you now to listen to those places in which body mapping and Jungian arts-based research meet in the presentations that follow. These that I have witnessed include those qualities listed here but you may perceive others. And with that, Hello. Hi. I only have loud and louder, so I don't think you'll have trouble hearing me. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Jeannie, for inviting the body to the Jungian circle for encouraging us to consider SOMA as belonging to arts-based research and giving our bodies an opportunity to tell their story. I'd like to expand on this process by sharing my own experience. An encounter earlier this year during the Healing Power, uh, Power of Creativity class with Dr. Scholl, where I first learned about the body map as a possible mode for psychological inquiry. Originally, my intention Apparently, Sonia's body map was ready to speak. <laughs> Originally, my intention was to simply add a somatic framework 
to my creative practice of graphic design, as well as to bolster the therapeutic function of Young's active imagination, which since then has become my big passion. What I perceived instead exceeded both aims. It awakened Soma and became that which helped me evoke a dynamic interiority, a quality of conscious consciousness that renders psyche accessible. My findings further confirm genies in that a body map enables us to see who we truly are, to feel into the mystery of our shared instinctual nature. This life-size image of the self I discovered has the capacity to transmit life-altering insight into those questions that seem impenetrable by the mind alone. I will now relate the story of my somatic awakening. It all started the minute I unrolled a large sheet of paper on my living room floor and invited Psyche to select the optimal form in which to position myself. I asked my husband to trace the contours of my body, immediately sensing that to maintain the integrity of a living container, this collaboration called for solitude. Once alone, I overlaid the form with personal photographs and wove them with artwork from previous active imagination sessions. Over the duration of roughly four days, the intensity escalated. Womb seeds planted long ago grew out of the shadows and invoked intolerable pain throughout my body. The tensions persisted until I found myself spontaneously moved to dance a sensation that felt as if I was the one being reassembled into new forms. Old dream imagery came flood, flooding in, accompanied by a wailing of tears that eventually materialized into a poem, a sort of a prayer, an unexpected turn of events that seemed to expedite the body mapping process along while simultaneously releasing the ego from having to think. A few days later, I was given an opportunity to perform the body map in front of an audience at the residential gathering. Naturally, I deflected. I'm a designer, <laughs> or so I thought. And thus convinced myself that the task was better suited for somatic therapists, poets, and ritual art performers. I had been treading the path with soul while seemingly ignoring the fact that I, like many of you here, had a body. <laughs> in hindsight, I literally just met my body in January, so this is very surprising to be here at this conference. <clears throat> in hindsight, this realization seems absurd, even laughable, but there is simply no denying that until this confrontation, the body, for me, was the most undervalued and underutilized source, source for knowledge making. Despite the ego's great effort to rationalize myself out of the so-called performance, I felt something primal longing to reveal itself. Terrified by what I perceived to be a lack of skill, I conceded to the task nonetheless. In fact, the word performance necessitated a dialogue with imaginal figures who encouraged me to refer to it as a creative exploration <laughs> instead. There's no denying that witnessing or being witnessed activates collaborative healing and that feeling into discomfort engages Soma. From this perspective, it is appropriate to wrestle performance away from ego and view the body map as a conscious ritual act of moving with images, an invocation with the capacity to unearth within oneself the so-called God image or the self, what Jung considered to be the eternal nucleus, seed of a personality. While engaged in active imagination, I was told that doming an eye mask, like the kind you sleep with, would tame any potential resistance that might come up. Here, unlike a masking commonly associated with the ego persona, the all-seeing eye mask imposes darkness on the external eyes while opening the inner to expose the eternal light of the cosmos existing within and without. 
At the residential, I set the stage for ritual by reading my poem, which also surprised me. <laughs> then entered the center of the room and covered my eyes, a signal to commence music and a means by which to summon soulful inquiry. As I explored the emergence of images that danced me, I became an inner witness to the unfolding cosmos, unswayed by the impression that this performance might have invoked in others. I moved, or rather, was moved by a numinous presence that guided each and every expression, including my breath. At the end, eye mask removed, I saw that my prayer dance was met with tears, my own and the tears of others in the room. A profound connection to the collective psyche, a gift of experience that continues to live in me today. By following this unconscious impulse to engage the unknown in front of many unfamiliar bodies, an act of out of vulnerability and trust, I seem to have awakened the inner dancer who impressed upon me a renewed sense of belonging to life itself. In the art of inquiry, Joseph Papin and Elizabeth Nelson wrote, the body speaks for psyche at important moments of psychological life. In hindsight, I can't help but wonder if this union arts-based research might have been motivated by a daimo who fooled me into dancing my humility, an unspoken prayer that accidentally became a living poem. Drawing from this experience, I believe a creative collaboration with Soma has the power to transcend the limitations of the rational mind. An act of humility and service to the animal body as an invaluable repertoire of forms through which to practice psychological attunement. A creation in and of itself, the body is a means by which we contribute to the world. What enables us to partake in the eternal reformulation of the original cosmic patterns belonging to one single psyche, ours. Regardless of our creative expression and whether we see ourselves as dancers or not, I find that an embodied practice unfurls the fullness of our mysterious erotic nature. My prayer dance leads me to conclude that by extending our bodies the integrity, our bodies the dignity of time and space, we honor the holistic value and creative intelligence in all that is, tangible or otherwise. Simply put, the body informs what it contains and opens a multiplicity of pathways through which healing becomes possible. The other one is Floreado in the Dove, which is the flowering of the soul, 
and how that is grace's meaning in a numinous experience, also known as the dreaming. And the third one I did was a study in the humans as a bridge, and it's called Naked as We Came, and it has to do with the human body, the life cycle, and the return to the unconscious. While I was studying these various colors, I also donned this net and was uh, immediately um, greeted by an impulse in my womb, and it tied into the feminine wisdom and how all of our ancestors, past, present, and future, are also held in the womb of what we call Sophia, the new God birthing. And so that as we pass from this realm to the other, they are tied together. So here is my photo film with three rituals and poetry as well as spoken word. <clears throat> The story of integrated cultures, old tribes acting as one collective human field, is the Rainbow Bridge. Be human, bridges to worlds. <coughs> the photo film about the sacred space of body and its connection to the past and future. The body erotic as sense receptacle for interacting with the conscious and unconscious realms. Reconnection to the body of memory as consort and communicator with psyche. Accessing ancient wisdom to co-create future as celestial dreamers in touch with the quantum fields. Moving with Kudandarismo's Lady Death through the Gate of Grace in order to better honor Body Bridge. Betting questions. If Betta and Mundi is the culmination of Rainbow Tribe prophecies, one united life through all time, how does my body connect to all the fields of existence? What place in the field of existence do humans inhabit once thriving and individuated? What is the unlived diamond life of humans once individuated, connected, and Sophia wise? How do we enter into the field of Young's predicted new god as a new paradigm of all human? Where does the new god, new paradigm, enter us? An ancient heartbreak living in the center of us between two unrequited lovers we'll call Eros and Logos. These divine counterparts have been separated so long that they barely remember they belong to one another. Though impossible to imagine because they are like night and day, the whole world is waiting for their sacred union. If only we could introduce them, they might remember. They might finally fall in love as destiny intended in a holy union of opposites within. Turner, page 56. The bridge between the sense world, physical, emotional, and psychic are expressions of our deepest, strongest riches they reside within us and form a bridge of self-connection and understanding between peoples. It is affirmation of our shared humanity and our place on the planet. The great remembering or reclamation of the feminine body of wisdom has much to do with a reclamation of our spiritual, non-rational knowledge that is our connection to ourselves, our lineage, and our shared bodies of wisdom. To live in this non-rational ancient mother wisdom is to be in touch with what has enabled life to exist and evolve. It is the fabric of our very existence. Indigenous wisdom sees Earth Mother as a living entity, a part of a complex structure, psyche, that is not dependent upon our cooperation, but would function more fully, smoothly, if Logos and Eros could be gapped. For life in the shadow realm to be reformed in wisdom's light is to forgive the past and reconcile wholeness with the cosmos. As containers, the divine feminine and body forces of psyche intelligence's direct connection as the anima or the unconscious, humans past and present are the bridge. The rainbow of cultures who live from all centers varying perspectives and possibilities for the expressed self we can allow the experiences of humans who have passed into liminal space, the fabric of human existence, no longer seeds in form but greater than body, to make up the living matrix that informs and reforms us. Remembrance of them is necessary. Acknowledgement of our solo perspective is vital. We must question the concretized egos that only acknowledge the material and cannot fathom an invisible thread of life that interconnects all beings. Through oneness with the psyche soul and all its parts, life pulses and shifts, permeating both flesh and the surrounding subtle bodies, contained within the feminine wisdom of all cultures. Each one of us, the seed of generations, is a constellated center 
God seed, self center, the harmonizer, bridge between realms, seen and unseen, the shadows and the light, hell and heaven. Contemplate now the supreme meaning and seek to understand what it is to be this body standing between two worlds and contained by the all. Enter soul of earth. Sacred feminine, anima, carrier of embryonic soul seed, white flame of ultimate cosmological plan. Embodied experience, soul imprint, mystical seeds harmonize. Higher cells, astral projections, life experience contains, heart prayers said in our consecrated centers, personal birth. Enter the soul of earth. Magma, wood and stone, water, fire and steam, mother's lodge, seed mystical center, soil body, earth memory, animated by blood, water, primordial images birthing in ancient seas, fire conscious life force preeminating in all directions, spirals, petroglyphs in motion, gates aligned with stars, let go of form, melt into primordial goo, Prima materia, sacred, as intended. Floriano and the Dove. To hold these things of delicate beauty and thorn, find the spaces between and hold on loosely to those things that will not last. Body ephemeral sands of time, Winds of changing tide, outer space, light, meet, inner glow, golden sands. Our existence is but one grain in the hands we are, molded and shaped by everyone and everything we do not know washes over and through us. The images we hold of the infinite, <coughs> directional change. In the finite we go on forever, so then, let us all go on forever. Sacred marriage, when anima marries animus, it becomes an integrated system of thought and feeling, mind, body, and soul. Archetypal wisdom traditions of the ancient mother allow the mother as memory keeper, body of memory to be remembered, liberated, set free. Our natural impulses in relation to memory and psychic communication allows us to learn new information and make greater connections between what lay within, thoughts, images, feelings, memories, the shadow, underworld, the past, anything that has been buried, repressed, or forgotten, dreams of the future. Now merge with the inner world, the outer world, the light of consciousness, and allow transformation to take place on all levels. Feeling is just the pathway to image. Image is the communication of psyche soul with humans. Imagination is our psychic communication to the whole. The imaginal realm, the diamond reality, expresses itself through form, human, merges, shifts. Psyche completes an alchemical process transforms old patterns, paradigms, and ways of being. This is the birthing of Sophia. Mm -hmm. Wisdom that is our soul essence, love merging with all human experience, of which we carry the generations. This is the beginning of wisdom to carry us forward, at the same time to take us back. As such, the human being is the bridge, place of understanding for evolution to take place. Evolution is the process of understanding the past, in order to intend and merge with future birthing, psyche somas realize potential. Jung described this process as the new God birthing, God being the archetype containing all archetypes, new patterns, new container. The diamond body is the rainbow that is both light and dark. Together they return to cosmological harmony and balance removing layers of overstructure so we can return to living with both lunar and solar qualities trusting the darkness as much as the light, remaining in connection to the past so we can move forward with a whole of existence towards a future reaching back towards us. things up and then introduce. <laughs> and a 
avoid that microphone. <laughs> to my studies at Pacifica, and I didn't realize how hungry my body was until I was invited to move it. <laughs> <laughs> I had researched, cross-referenced, um, gained a ton of knowledge, but I hadn't checked in with my body. I had sat, I had researched, I had clenched, I had been at a computer. And so like a good union art space researcher, which I had just learned about, <clears throat> I decided to take the idea that psyche and matter meet, that these two worlds exchange information. And I decided to ask my autonomous psyche, um, what message does my body have? My cellular body, <clears throat> my genetic body, um, <clears throat> If I have an inheritance of information woven into my skin, my teeth, my gestures, um, can I listen to that? Can I listen to my cellular body, my ancestral body, my biological body, my emotional body? And as a poet, <laughs> and because it's arts-based research, these are the poems that responded to my question. <clears throat> The final poem is a pictograph, so it's right here if you all want to take one before you head out. The body <clears throat> in four poems. Poem one. My heart, my art, my drone. Let me go back to where this story starts. Three million years ago, I watched water carve a canyon into being. I did not blink. Later, when my mother and I constructed my body, we likewise assembled first the cave that would hold me. Each lung a gill, every synapse and sinew a song. You see this body, this heart, yours, mine, is the ancestral shaman. She, the Red Mother, fills when she is empty and empties when she is full. Before you entered the body house, she sat by the fire center of you and whispered instructions to the egg. Right, left, upper, lower. Years later, when you were in a car accident, she screamed so loud that the drumming nearly stopped. She said, that sound is death hunting, go fast, now go faster. Then she held you, your back arched up in the sky where it was turquoise. When you came back down to your body, when it was safe to do so, she rocked you. Out, in, up, down. Poem two. The rib. Bones are the oracles of winter. At 4 a.m., when you are curled warm under blankets, your bones leap from the muscle house and go dancing. Mm -hmm. When you and I were both little, we did this because the adults had not yet told us that we couldn't. In the middle of the night, our skeletons met. I looked deep into the black purple socket that held your day eyes and told you I saw my own reflection. And you saw my finger bones in moonlight and told me they look like tiny white feathers. Each rib cage is a procession of grandmothers. This one grew red cheeked in the Iberian Peninsula. The next one crawled from the clay earth and named each of her daughters after the first animals to appear once they were born. Each body is inlaid with a sacred text. Each letter within it contains its own history. Mine knows 
that on a green island thousands of years ago, the wise one cast knuckles and teeth into the center. In the formation of these oracle bones, they saw us together here. They knew we would recognize ourselves by the particular shapes that formed between our bodies. Exactly here, us, now. Poem three, this is a pictograph. It looks like a body. <laughs> Your body is a sacred river. It is the place through which vessels must pass before giving bread and request to the spirit beings. It is the mountain, layer upon layer of initiatory material. It contains the question and the answer. Your body is a map of your past and of your future. Hair flexes, shivers, gauges, and gathers. If you listen, every follicle sounds awake. Each is a different grandmother, an ancestor long since past. It is the wound and the antidote, your medicine, the acolyte, the wise one. Your body is the history of your people. The cellular story of both the first people conquered and the conquerors. It contains every story of every cave inhabited, each ochre handprint, each bear that entered the earth womb for the long ice age sleep from which your seemingly immaculate soul was born. Started calling my attention. Oy. 
and centers of energy. <laughs> my heart that wanted to gain voice and my voice that wanted to become freer. And here's a little video of the process of making the map. <laughs> So I've been re as I've been reaching deeper into the understanding of Oya, the Orisha, the goddess of the winds and the storms, my body map have been, has been a guide to help me to tap into her qualities, the qualities that are inherent in me. She's depicted in it, and it has become a beacon of wisdom that hanging on my wall every day, I would turn to for her guidance looking for clarity in times of uncertainty. More than a companion, she in the map has become a North Star, a home I can come to, a familiar place that, like the sacred song, I sang at the beginning of this presentation, reminds me that when every other... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we're gonna stop fighting. She has reminded me that when everything else fails, I should keep looking for my spiritual dance and spiritual song. And today I continue using my voice to create bridges between worlds, fearing not to take up space in many languages and to birth my boldest visions. Não esquece que você é a dona da porra toda. Just don't forget that you are the main character of the whole thing. Don't forget. Não esquece que você é a dona da porra toda. So what do you want from life? From life? I want poems. Orgasms, <laughs> intertwined souls, meaningful exchanges, and re-evolution. This was a poem written by a Brazilian poet called Kiani Leon. And with that, I end my presentation. <laughs>
So I'd love to hear from them, and then we'll invite your insights as well. So take it away, ladies. Oh, oh. Oh, I'll win first. Okay. Well, I, you know, this was a part of my presentation, so I'm not going to repeat it, but I definitely, um, it's interesting because the class came towards the end of my program at Pacifica, right? My time at Pacifica. It, it, I had the class this January, and um, it might have been the first time I met my body. Um, I... As, as a designer, as a mother of um, two small children and um, who actually struggled with infertility for so long, I had a really deep dialogue with, argue with my body that, you know, uh, uh, attempting to force it into creation. And so I really, I approached a very masculine kind of sensibility towards my body. I, um, and what I learned, um, literally this year was that my body was tired of being told what to do <laughs> and that was a huge awakening so the somatic awakening for me was so transformative because as i was developing the skill of active imagination and which is profound for me completely changed the way i design it changed the way i parent it changed the way uh, it changed my life i realized that the body wanted to participate more. And a big thing for me was actually Marion Woodman. I had a profound experience reading her book, Sitting by the Whale, and listening to her recording. Something really shifted for me. And so this class for me was truly profound. So I appreciate that to encourage this exploration. Um, what was my, my, my overall experience really had to do with, um, with moving from re-indigenization, which I think is the process of combating colonialism. Um, I was not raised on reservations, um, and in fact it wasn't until I was in my 20s that my native ancestry roots came to the fore because a teacher came and found me and told me mm -hmm. who and who I was. Um, I actually had been raised with very little awareness of the fact that I was brown. <laughs> and it was always surprising to me when people would point it out. And that was because I grew up in places like the East Bay in California. And my father was the last of a uh, native tradition to have lived in an adobe house in the Rio Grande Valley in El Paso, Texas. And, and by the time that he moved from what at that time had been considered poverty into colonialization and he colonized us, he sent us to college, I was high school teacher in my first profession, um, a lot of the information in my family had been lost. And so I had a brain tumor in my 20s, I was suffering from depression, I had a lot of things that were happening to me when my indigenous teacher found me. And uh, first thing she said was, ah, that's your sister! <laughs> And I thought, who is this crazy lady coming and telling me this? But it did turn out that through uh, genealogical records and family stories that we did have native blood. Not only did we have it from Chihuahua with my mother, but also we had it up into New Mexico in the Southwest, we had the name. And, um, and so I've been uh, given that task to be the, the rememberer and the story reclaimer. Um, and so I had been in that for about 20 years, I'm 47 now, and uh, in the, one of the last ritual arts that I did, I heard, okay, you have to let your ancestors go now. And I was like, what? What is this message? And what I was given was that they're in a celestial form, that if we can allow them to outgrow the seed of their consciousness in these small shells of bodies, then we become connected to this greater reality that is part of the cosmological psyche. And that was that living matrix that I experienced in my body. Once I started to get outside of that realm and then expand, then I started to feel this actual living web that was issuing out from my womb and having that understanding that reconnecting to feminine wisdom isn't just about our own wombs, or our own bodies, or our own blood lineage, but it actually has to do with the human race being held inside of something much larger. And um, and that was quite profound. And I'm still gonna see how that unfolds for me in the future. Um, so 
So my main finding is that the body is imbued with psyche. <laughs> Might seem like an obvious realization when you're in a union program, but um, I see the body as my house, and I think it's the only way through which I have access to my own personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. So um, for me, it was just being quiet enough and listening deeply enough and to myself, <laughs> which contained the knowledge of the first creature that stepped out of the ocean. So mm -hmm. a very Jungian approach to the body as image, but a deep, deep image, a cellular image. Well, for me, coming from Brazil, the body is very present, um, I would say, in our culture, but a lot in my life. So it wasn't a difficult task to connect to the body, so much so that we've been in relationship with the body map and I for the last six months. Um, and my finding is definitely, if I feel like the body is urging me and us to continue continuously be in this relationship to release and discover past, present, and future. So much so that what we had agreed I was going to present today was based on the class presentation. And still yesterday I was struggling with it. I was like, no, this is past. My body wants to do something else. So yesterday at midnight, it came through <laughs> what it needed to be shown and presented and spoken of in the present. So what can you um, share as your perceptions, however they unfold? Yes, please. Well, I just want to share that what I'm experiencing in my body is tremendous joy and gratitude for the four of you. And of course, your professor also is just, it's just beautiful, beautiful presentation. And this is what I experience working with my patients and in analysis, working with them. that. They, you know, actually there are intergenerational psychological wounds that sometimes people, like people who had had ancestors who had traumas, like in um, uh, uh, all kinds of traumas that get passed down. And then their grandchildren or great grandchildren don't know what these are in their bodies. And doctors can't find anything. And then what we find is it's actually a psychological wound or trauma that the body has been carrying for multiple generations. So I just wanted to say thank you. It's wonderful. Well, I'll just say that this tied in so well with the keynote speaker. The word awe <laughs> is the word that I have for all of you, Jean, for what you've done with your work. And all of you and the sharing that you did. I just, I can't tell you the overwhelm, overwhelming feeling of awe that I've had listening to you and your journey doing this. It's such important work. So all I can say is thank you from deep within myself. Well, I truly appreciated the humor with which we began, which is, oh, Right, we have a body. <laughs> um, because unions and, and many, many millions, billions of people around the world don't remember that fact. Um, so I just, I, I loved that. And what I want to set alongside the mention of intergenerational trauma is also intergenerational vitality. <laughs> that somatic vitality. The, 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 the living presence, not only of our ancestors, but our own ability to somatically uh, live and engage with them. That they are a tremendous source of uh, insight, guidance. Um, it's, a, it's a profound, profound relationship. And I just want to thank you, all of you, for, for the wonderful work that you presented today. Just adding on to what everybody else has said, and, uh, thank you so much for the beautiful presentation and uh, the beautiful works and where you all went with it. Um, as an artist and 
somebody who's been dealing with chronic pain for more than eight years, and um, you know, the body is such a fascinating and powerful thing to work with, and I really love everything that's gone into the visual aspect, and I really appreciate how you guys have brought other forms of expression into it as well, with poetry and dance and singing and everything. But, you know, because I am a visual artist, I was just wondering, you know, I feel like a two-dimensional image is incredible, but I feel like I want more dimensionality. Like, for example, if we're just talking about at the level around the heart, there's a whole difference between the experience in the innermost part of the body around the heart and the front, you know, the front of the rib cage, the back. And, you know, similarly, we, we might have differences between the present moment, the past, the future, or you might think about the worst parts of our lives and the best parts. I, do some people like make three different depth maps, kind of for front, inner, and uh, back, or past, present, future? Any, any thoughts about that, any of that? Well, one a aspect is to actually do it in clay, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. which is a way of getting dimensional. Another practice that um, I like to do is going toward um, the yogic philosophy of the chakras. And not just thinking about um, not only meditating, but for the root chakra, pounding around a little bit. And when you get to the heart, using the arms. And even, you know, as we get into the third eye, just finding no prescription, but finding ways of letting the body express. And, and, and sometimes it can be shocking. If I may comment on that. Yeah. The hardest part for me was not to be a designer. Mm -hmm. And so, and my least favorite approach to visual expression is collage. I hate collage <laughs> because it's too messy. You know, I teach an arts and a color of design. I teach branding, packaging, I'm a spatial designer. So for me, everything is about precision and I love minimalism. Yeah. So the fact that I got down on my fours and got charcoal and just like printed random pictures from my phone was was really shocking to me. I was just covered, the house looked like a war zone that still is covered in charcoal. Like it's just everywhere, graphite and, and charcoal. So, and my children are on there, we're half naked. It's just the whole thing is messy and messy is not what I do. But I have to say that music gave me that dimensionality. And so, you know, within the interest of time, there was just not enough time to actually it was an Enneagram uh, artist, I'm totally blanking on his name right now, but um, who uh, represented the Enneagram 7, which I, the point I identify as, and I played it in the background. And as I played it, it was all about putting on an eye mask. So half of that actually is done completely blindfolded. I had no idea what I was gluing where and where the charcoal was, which is so surprising, just completely allowing that to guide me, but that's how I do active imagination sessions. So the musical component added that dimensionality, and it's interesting because some of us had the feeling of taping it to the wall, and I needed to crawl. So all of it was surprising. There was no plan. Okay. Speaking of time. Yes. <laughs> it's over. So it's great. Over. <laughs> Thank you. I've had your oh. hand up since the beginning. I would yes. really love oh, for a session. I, this is a very special presentation for me. I am very, very grateful. And I wanted just to point out with Sonia, your, 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 the position you were in uh, makes me think of Koyoshiawski, mm. no? this, this goddess that actually, um, um, by her being this member, the, 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 the cosmos was, created, no? Mm. And I knew that, but then um, we were we were able to, as a, as a group that were working together called Taloneras, we had been working on a mix of creation and destruction to make sense of after the pandemic. Mm. And uh, and I didn't know, but uh, another another member of the, the salon, which uh, is a graduate from Pacifica also, from the mythology department, she, she gave us this beautiful um, lecture about the mythology of the 
of Azu and Tiamat, mm -hmm. which is one of the oldest creation myths. And it's also about two energies, uh, female and, mm -hmm. and masculine um, energies that get, gets together. Then all the kids start re refer, uh, you know, uh, being born. And then they, I think Absu is the one that says, I, I cannot bear them anymore, let's kill them. And Tiamat says, no, they're our kids, let's not kill them. So after many generations, uh, um, uh, she, that she is, uh, is associated with, uh, with salt water, mm -hmm. after many years, the, the image of her is of a monster. Mm -hmm. And Marduk, who's a, a, a hero in, in the, the Sumerian culture uh, gets to kill her. So he kills his great, great, great grandmother and with her, the pieces of her, um, the, the, the universe gets created. Mm. So again, wow. it's like the creation is linked with the killing of the feminine, mm -hmm. no? Mm. So then a lot of your images are of like a, yes. like a very vulnerable position, but yes. nevertheless it's a birthing position. Mm -hmm. So it's, the creation and destruction yeah, is right. just there. So, yes. so you've been working mm -hmm. the same as us, but in like yes. different places. So, <laughs> thank you so yes. much.